Today's webinar is uh, based upon security clearance adjudication processes for DOD contractors and military members and DOD civilian employees. Um, some of this can be overlapped for other agencies, but this is primarily for uh, DOD, um, the Department of Defense. Um, so as, uh, as Taylor mentioned, uh, my name is Ryan Nerney. I'm a managing partner at Tolly Rinky. Uh, I'm the managing partner of the uh, firm's California office. Um, Anthony Kuhn is also the managing partner um, of uh, Tolly Rinky's Buffalo office. Um, he will be joining us uh, hopefully later on in the presentation. Uh, so I'm going to take the reins at the beginning. Um, as it's, as you see here, um, I'm the executive board or on the executive board for the National Security Lawyers Association. Um, and Anthony Kuhn is the chair of the National Security Lawyers Association. Uh, as, a, as a disclaimer, um, this is not, this presentation is not intended to be legal advice. Uh, the views are expressed in this, uh, that are expressed in this publication are the authors and do not imply any endorsement by uh, any uh, government agency, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, the intelligence community, or like I said, any other uh, government uh, agency. Now, topics of discussion today, uh, as I said before, we're going to uh, go over the adjudicative process uh, between Department of Defense contractors, members of the U.S. military, um, and federal employees, primarily the Department of Defense, as I said, uh, the regulations governing each um, the two processes invoking executive orders uh, 10865 and 12968, um, and essentially uh, discuss the differences of those uh, adjudicative processes. Because uh, even though they're both under the, the purview of the Department of Defense, uh, there are some, um, I would call them significant differences uh, in how each one is adjudicated for security clearances. Uh, as a hot topic, uh, I will briefly discuss the reapplication process. Uh, if your clearance is denied or revoked um, after going through one of these adjudicative processes, um, the process is a, a little bit different. Uh, I would say it's more structured for reapplications for uh, contractors as opposed to uh, military members or federal employees. All right, going to uh, the, the DOD contractor adjudication, um, this is also in, uh, called industrial uh, adjudication. So the industrial side of um, the Department of Defense. Um, as with any security clearance, it always begins with obtaining a sponsor uh, and completing a security clearance application. That security clearance application is called a standard, 486, uh, standard form 86, an SF-86, um, it's usually through, or not usually, it is through the EQIP um, uh, program, uh, which is all online. Um, previously, back you know years ago, they never used to do that, but now everything's online. Um, it's also also considered or called a questionnaire for national security processing, uh, QNSP. Um, so there's various different names for it, but the most common is an EQIP or an SF-86. Uh, there's different levels of an SF. Um, a security clearance application, um, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to talk about um, uh, it, it's strictly the SF-86 because SF-86 governs um, clearances from like secret, top secret, top secret, sensitive compartmented information, uh, SCI, uh, things of that nature. Um, once you submit an SF or once an individual submits an SF-86, um, they engage in the investigative process. So obtaining a sponsor and submitting an SF-86 begins the investigative process uh, through uh, the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, also known as DCSA. Um, it used to be OPM that did these things, the Office of Personnel Management um, through the NSA. Uh, NNSA. Uh, now it's everything is going through the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Uh, I believe in about 20, 2020, um, 2021, 2020 timeframe, um, the agencies were, uh, or everything was consolidated uh, into DCSA. So now DCSA is essentially in charge of not only uh, a branch of it anyways, it's in charge of not only the investigative process, uh, but also the adjudicative process as well. Uh, once you start the investigative process, you submit your SF-86, uh, then anything uh, with a secret clearance or higher, uh, even public trust, um, a lot of the times now, uh, require a personal subject interview. 
Uh, essentially, that personal subject interview is going to uh, go over every aspect of what you put in your SF-86. Um, as any problem areas that the investigator sees, they'll probably spend more time on those particular areas of your SF-86. Uh, but essentially, they're going to go through um, that that uh, form um, and determine if there are any um, uh, issues and to also clarify any information um, that they may need clarification on. Uh, maybe something wasn't explained correctly or thoroughly enough uh, to their liking. Uh, so that process uh, or that interview process will uh, will happen after uh, you submit the the SF-86. Um, now, once you submit uh, the SF-86 and go through the personal subject interview, um, then what happens is is that um, that investigator, if you will, uh, basically takes everything and puts it into uh, I'll call it a report of investigation. It's not really an actual report, but you know they basically compile everything um, and then it goes to the adjudicators in order to make a determination. Um, sometimes what happens is is that uh, individuals um, contractors are issued interrogatories or supplemental information requests. Uh, they used to be called SIRs or supplemental information requests. Now they're typically uh, just called a VROC inquiry, Vetting Risk Operations Center. Um, essentially, it's the same thing. What they're doing in those, whether it's interrogatories or a VROC in inquiry, is they're asking for additional information on some potential uh, security concern areas. Uh, maybe they don't have enough information. Uh, maybe they're um, they're asking for updates. Whatever the situation is, um, if they need additional information in order to adjudicate that clearance. Uh, they'll go through that process and either ask uh, issue interrogatories or uh, a VROC inquiry. Um, if after that um, there's still some uh, security concerns uh, that are unresolved, then what happens is DCSA would issue a, some, uh, a statement of reasons. Um, if it's in the industrial side, uh, as we're talking about now, that would include what they call an ISCR case number. Um, an ISCR case number is uh, essentially just an identifying number. It's essentially a case number um, like you would have in like any normal uh, court proceeding uh, that basically designates your specific statement of reasons and your specific case. Um, if you go onto the, the Doha website, the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, um, you can see a, a number of these cases that um, have these ISCR case numbers. Um, once you get the statement of reasons, uh, as a contractor, uh, you have an opportunity to submit a written response. Uh, typically, it's within 20 days of your receipt of that statement of reasons that you have to submit the written response. Um, and then essentially what happens is, is you would have a hearing in front of an administrative judge. Um, you don't have to have a hearing. If you don't have a hearing, then you can just request a decision on the written record. Um, which would essentially result in the issuance of what they call a file of relevant material. Um, by the uh, Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals um, attorney. Uh, and essentially, that's just their written case. And then you would have an opportunity to respond to that, uh, that written case without having to appear in front of a judge. Um, typically, uh, one of the best way to, uh, to kind of address that uh, or any potential concerns is to appear in front of a judge. But ultimately, that's, that's your decision. Um, but uh, you would have the opportunity to appear in front of the administrative judge. Then once you have your hearing, you present your evidence, you uh, present your mitigation, uh, then that uh, decision from the administrative judge will come down. It'll be a written decision where the judge will provide uh, all of their um, analysis, if you will. Um, and uh, they'll basically provide you with whatever the decision is, which is to either deny or revoke your clearance um, or to uh, grant you your clearance. Uh, the timelines for these can vary um, from the outset of submitting your SF-86 all the way until you get a decision from an administrative judge. Um, I've seen it as short as like six, seven months, and I've seen it take as long as like two years. Um, it just kind of depends on how many concerns they have, um, how long it takes the judges to make decisions, you know, things like that. Um, obviously, that process would be significantly shorter if there's no issuance of a statement of reasons or anything like that. But if you have to go through the further adjudicative process, um, then then that uh, that's kind of the process for for government contractors. Um, now, the regulations uh, that 
um, are applicable to government contractors um, are the executive order 10865. I kind of put a quote of essentially what uh, the general timelines are and what I kind of just went over, but essentially um, this kind of this order kind of lays out that, um, you know, you can't have any specific um, final denial or revocation of a security clearance without having a written statement of the reasons why your access authorization is denied or revoked an opportunity to reply in writing. Um, and after you file that uh, written response to the statement of reasons, then an opportunity to appear personally. Um, reasonable time to prepare for that in person appearance. Typically that reasonable time is uh, 15 days or more. Um, sometimes in rare circumstances, if uh, the judge wants to kind of expedite that, um, you'll have to waive uh, that 15 day time frame uh, and a judge will ask you to do that. But for most, most of the time that doesn't happen. They usually give you two weeks to a month, sometimes even longer than that uh, leeway to prepare. Um, an opportunity to be represented by counsel so you can hire an attorney for these types of personal appearances. Uh, in fact, you can hire an attorney anywhere from when you submit your SF-86 all the way up through the actual appeals process that we'll talk about uh, in, a little, uh, in a little bit. Um, during the personal appearance, the, the individual uh, should have an opportunity to cross-examine uh, individuals um, to essentially uh, go over what's in the statement of reasons. Um, that's typically a uh, government, um, or excuse me, a per, uh, the the interviewer who did the personal subject interview. Um, but in these Isker case uh, hearings, um, that is very rare for the government to call witnesses at all. Um, so it's typically going to be the applicant or the individual who's trying to get the clearance uh, presenting their case, uh, presenting the um, any witnesses that they have, and then they would typically testify as well. Um, and then once uh, the hearing is done, as I mentioned previously, a written notice of the final decision in the case, um, and which will lay out kind of the appeal options um, at that point. Um, so that's kind of the executive order and um, all the actual general, um, or I, sh I should say more specific uh, guidelines uh, related to DOD contractors and the process for adjudication and, and the, um, the security clearance guidelines and things like that are governed uh, with the DOD Directive 5220.6. Um, this directive uh, provides a number of instructions, um, paragraphs, guidelines, uh, everything that essentially is needed for um, an understanding of the process and, and what is looked at in order to adjudicate these, uh, these hearings on the contractor side. Um, it incorporates the seed for the Security Executive Agent, Agency uh, Agent Directive Four, which lays out the 13 adjudicative guidelines. That's guidelines, um, you know, anywhere from uh, drug use, uh, personal conduct, um, financial considerations, uh, anything that is going to elicit a statement of reasons is going to be um, looked at and viewed under those 13 adjudicative guidelines. And all those are laid out through the DOD Directive 5220.6. Um, the DOD directive does um, provide uh, the same type of process for other organizations that may be outside of the DOD, um, but ultimately it all comes back to, uh, you know, the adjudicative guidelines, which is what uh, any, any agency is going to look at, whether it's DOD, Department of Energy, um, anything along those lines um, in order to determine if somebody should have a clearance or not. Um, the contractor, the DOD contractor appeals process uh, is a little bit different. Um, the DOD contractors appeals options are again laid out in the DOD directive 5220.6. Um, so the, in the event that a decision um, is to deny or revoke an applicant's uh, security clearance, that individual does have the opportunity to appeal. Um, the DOD directive, the specific paragraph is enclosure three, paragraph E3, Point one, point two, eight. Um, that basically lays out uh, what the process is. Both the applicants, um, so the individuals seeking a clearance, or the department counsels, those attorneys for the Department of uh, Defense, uh, Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, can appeal judges' decisions. So even if you get a favorable decision, uh, the department counsel can appeal that decision. It doesn't happen very often, but they do have that ability to to appeal the uh, the decision. Um, as far as timelines go, the timelines for appeals for uh, contractors um, are very unique. 
And I say they're unique because you have 15 days from the date of the judge's decision to appeal uh, the decision. Not 15 days from receipt, but 15 days from the date of the judge's decision. Um, so that's a very important uh, timeline. Um, I am completely unsure of why they have that process and why it's not 15 days from receipt, uh, because that would make more sense to me. However, uh, that's the specific timeline that they have. Um, so any type of appeal as a DOD contractor um, needs to be, the notice of appeal needs to be submitted within 15 days of the date of the judge's decision. And that's just the notice of appeal. Once you submit that notice, basically putting the appeal board on notice that uh, the appeal board is with the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, um, you put them on notice that you want to appeal, then you'll have 30 days thereafter to actually submit a, an actual appeal brief. Uh, making your arguments as far as what you want to do and, and uh, why you're appealing the decision. Now, the adjudicative process for DOD federal employees and military members is a little bit different. Um, so it's the same as contractors as far as beginning with obtaining a sponsor and completing your security clearance application. Um, <laughs> any agency you start with, um, regardless of, again, if it's DOD, Department of Energy, um, any of the intelligence agencies, anything like that, are going to start with the, the completion of an SF-86 and obtaining sponsorship. Um, you go through the same thing, engaging in the investigative process through the through DCSA. Um, you're going to have a, su a personal subject interview, again, through DCSA. And you're going to be issued a statement of reasons in the event that uh, there are some security concerns that are um, still present after the investigation. However, this is where everything kind of differs uh, between the contractors um, and the federal employees. Um, so as a federal employee or a member of the military, you'll get issued a statement of reasons from DCSA. Um, sometimes it still has DOD cap on there, which is Defense, Department of Defense Consolidated Adjudication Facility. Um, they just haven't updated their, their, their letterheads in some circumstances, but it's essentially from DCSA. And DCSA is going to be the one who's going to be uh, taking a look at and reviewing this. Um, there is not initially a case number designated on a statement of reasons for federal employees and military members. There eventually will be a case number if you end up getting to a hearing, but at this stage, there, there isn't really a, a case number. They kind of use your social security number in order to kind of um, uh, determine whose case is, is what. Once you get that statement of reasons, you'll have an opportunity to uh, respond in writing uh, that is reviewed by DCSA adjudicators. Um, now, the difference here is that typically you're uh, given either 30 or 60 days, depending on what organization you work for and if you're in the military, um, to respond to the statement of reasons. So 20 days for a contractor, about 30 to 60 days for um, a military member or civilian employee. Now. Uh, the difference here is that um, DCSA, once you submit your written response and they've had an opportunity to review everything that you submitted, uh, there is a written decision that comes back, comes down from DCSA, and that decision results in the revocation or denial uh, of the security clearance and then the reasons for that unfavorable decision. And then if the decision is, um, is unfavorable, then you have an opportunity to appeal. Um, if the decision is favorable after you submit the written response, um, nine times out of 10, your security officer will be notified um, without an in-depth explanation, um, and you'll just be good to go. Um, for federal employees and for military members, um, everything typically has to go through your security officer. So for the contractor side, you can submit everything directly to DCSA. Uh, for military members or federal employees, everything needs to be submitted uh, through your security officer through the program called the De uh, Defense Information System for Security. Uh, that used to be JPASS, but now it's DISS, uh, and everything is uploaded through that through that uh, that program. Now the regulations uh, for DoD employees uh, and and military members a little bit different. They all incorporate the seed four, as I discussed in the 13 adjudicative guidelines, but it's a little bit different um, as far as the executive orders go. Um, and essentially the executive order 12968, as well as the DOD manual 5200.02M, those kind of lay out the process for, um, and, and essentially lays out the differences um, in the administrative due process process for uh, military members or federal employees. So 
everything that I kind of just went over as far as the differences go and that I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, that kind of lays out uh, the, the DOD manual 5200.02M and the executive order 12968 lay those processes out, which is, again, different than what a contractor would um, uh, would be able to uh, the due process for contractors, um, which is why they have different executive orders and different um, uh, manuals or directives. Uh, because the processes again are different. Uh, but so, like I said, the executive order 12968 and DOD manual 5200.02M are the ones that kind of uh, regulate or govern federal employees and military members. Um, however, it all comes back to, to the same adjudicative guidelines, which are the 13 adjudicative guidelines setting out both disqualifying and mitigating conditions for any type of security concerns. Um, it's all incorporated in the seed for, like I said before. Um, so, even though the actual due process aspect is different, um, ultimately, the uh, how they adjudicate these, meaning like what they look at to determine if somebody should or should not have a security clearance, it's all based upon the C4 and those 13 adjudicative guidelines. Um, now, the appeals process. So, this is, again, where, where things are different. So, you heard me mention uh, previously um, with... Um, you heard me mention previously with uh, government contractors and how those government contractors um, have an appeals process after they have a hearing. The difference here is that uh, once there's a written decision from DCSA and once that's received, uh, then um, your clearance is revoked at that point. Um, and you can appeal that decision via a written appeal or a personal appearance in front of an administrative judge uh, with the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so you, you see kind of how I made a difference there. So it's a hearing uh, typically with uh, government contractors uh, for federal employees or military members. It's called a personal appearance. Um, I don't know why they designate that. The process is fairly similar. Um, as far as like presenting your case, appearing in person, having witnesses, things like that. Um, but uh, ultimately, it's called the personal appearance um, as part of this this process. Now, it's important to understand that, again, at this point, your clearance is revoked. So you're appealing that decision uh, through either a written appeal or a personal appearance. If you choose the personal appearance, then you would appear in front of a Doha administrative judge. Um, and uh, unlike a government contractor where the judge's decision is final, um, pending obviously an actual appeal to the appeal board, here a Doha administrative judge's decision are just simply recommendations um, and they're not final decisions. So most of the time I would say probably, don't quote me on this, like 99% of the time um, any recommendation from a Doha administrative judge um, would would be uh, followed um, by the Personal Security Appeals Board, um, but they don't have to. Um, now, the Personal Security Appeals Board uh, is, and they have different designations under each branch of the military service. They have a PSAP for the Army, for the Navy, um, for, and the Navy obviously covers um, the, uh, the Marines, um, for the Air Force, um, anything like that. Um, and I don't mention um, the Coast Guard because the Coast Guard is actually governed under uh, DHS. Um, but uh, for these aspects, the Personal Security Appeals Board for each one of those organizations has the ultimate final say and conducts it conducts a de novo review of every single recommended decision. <laughs> de novo review essentially just means that they can look at everything um, individually and they're not just looking at kind of um, you know, uh, just what the judge's decision is, they can kind of look at everything and essentially means that they can make their own decision and not have to follow it, uh, follow the judge's decision or recommendations. Um, now, again, like I said, you know, every uh, every recommended uh, decision by an administrative judge, uh, you know, in 99% of the cases, PSAB goes along with that decision. Um, but, um, uh, you know, that's why it's important to make sure that you're, you know, presenting a good case uh, you know, at your personal appearance. Um, and also difference between the, the appeals is, is that appeals for government contractors, you cannot submit any additional evidence. You can't submit any documentation, anything like that. Essentially, you're, you're, um, you're, you're limited to just providing ev or, uh, arguments as to why the judge's decision was inaccurate um, and why it should be overturned or remanded back to that judge. 
for personal appearances um, with the PSAB. PSAB uh, can um, obtain uh, new evidence, um, whether that's through the actual personal appearance process itself, or even on some occasions I've seen PSAB actually reach back out to the security officer and request to see if the uh, appellant in this case um, has any additional documentation um, to submit. The appeal board for contractors doesn't do that. Um, so there's that kind of difference between the appeals process as well. Um, now, the the summary of the differences in the adjudicative process, I'll kind of just go over. For contractors, you have the opportunity to appear personally prior to any denial or revocation, um, which is required again by executive order 10865. Um, and it's also incorporated by the DOD directive 5220.6. Military members, like I mentioned before, um, they're provided an opportunity to appear personally in front of a Doha administrative judge as part of their appeal after their clearance has already been denied. And again, like I said, for contractors, um, if you uh, at the per, uh, excuse me at the hearing, you can submit evidence and things like that, and then ultimately the judge provides that final written denial. Um, if you end up getting your clearance denied after you appeared in front of a judge on the contractor side, uh, then you appeal that decision within 15 days. Uh, you submit the notice of appeal and 30 days thereafter, you submit your, your actual appeal brief um, and you can't submit any new evidence. Again, as I indicated for the military members and civilian employees, that's different. Your clearance is already revoked by the time you appear in front of a judge for that personal appearance, and you can submit additional documents, evidence, have witnesses and things like that at your actual personal appearance itself. Um, and then ultimately, like I said, PSAB has the final say. Um, so that's the primary difference is essentially when you have your personal appearance and kind of when that revocation or denial decision um, occurs. Uh, one thing I did want to mention for the, the contractors uh, industrial side is that, you know, you submit a personal appearance or excuse me, you submit a written response to a statement of reasons on the contractor side. A lot of times uh, and, and you submit that directly to DCSA um, as opposed to going through security officer. A lot of times uh, DCSA acts as kind of the middleman. Um, so they don't necessarily look at, they will look at your response, but they won't necessarily adjudicate that. What they typically do is they forward it on to Doha. And then if that written response is going to be enough to mitigate the concerns, then a department counsel will take a look at it. And if it's enough to mitigate those concerns simply on the written response, then they'll recommend the withdrawal of the statement of reasons. Um, so either way, it's always a good opportunity to respond to uh, any type of statement of reasons in writing because you never want to forego an opportunity to uh, mitigate any concerns by the government. Um, so I just want to point that out. Then after that, you have your hearing or you can actually, um, you know, request a decision on the written record, which, you know, is essentially doing the same thing as if you submit a written response. So it's it's usually a better idea to, uh, to appear in front of... Uh, uh, an administrative judge, but ultimately, um, you know, that's that's obviously your call. But either way, the due process needs to be followed, um, you know, in each one of these uh, circumstances. Now, uh, a brief overview of the reapplication process. So the reapplication process is a little bit different for each one of these, whether it's a contractor on the industrial side or if they're military members or federal employees. So um, for contractors, um, First of all, for either one of these uh, processes, you need to obtain new sponsorship. You need to complete a new security clearance application. Um, so essentially, if your clearance is denied or revoked, you're essentially started from scratch. You need to obtain a new sponsorship, submit a new SF-86. Um, in that new SF-86, uh, because your clearance would have been denied or revoked at that point, that would be something that would have to be disclosed, I believe is in section 26 of the SF-86, if I'm not mistaken. That essentially asks if you've ever gone through any type of uh, security clearance uh, process um, or adjudicative process, if you will, or investigation. You'd have to obviously respond in the affirmative and then provide an explanation as far as any type of uh, uh, decision on that. So, again, if it was revoked or denied, that would be something that would have to be disclosed on the security clearance application. Uh, and once you disclose that on the security clearance application, and what that'll do is that'll trigger a new uh, 
a new investigation for your security clearance. Um, and as a contractor, Doha will be essentially tipped off um, that you reapply for a clearance at that point. <clears throat> and at that point, you would have to uh, submit new um, or uh, additional evidence to show that the allegations that previously caused your denial or revocation um, have been resolved or have been mitigated. Um, now, for each one of these circumstances, you can't start a reapplication process. Um, until it's been at least 12 months from the date of your revocation. So on the contractor side, that's 12 months from the date of the judge's decision, regardless if you appeal or not. On the military member side or federal employee side, it's 12 months from whenever PSAP makes that final decision if you decide to appeal, or if you decide not to appeal, then it's whenever that revocation occurred. Um, so once you wait that 12 months, then you can reapply and submit that. If you try to do it before, it's not going to, you're not going to be able to do it. They'll flag it. They'll make sure that you have to wait that, that full 12 months. So, um, back to the, uh, the actual process. So once, um, on the contractor side, once, uh, Doha is tipped off that you submitted a new reapplication uh, request, um, then you usually or get a letter from Doha requesting information or evidence of mitigation, um, of those previous concerns. That letter typically provides 60 days. Uh, to actually provide um, that reapplication. Uh, what we do here at our firm is we submit what we call a reapplication brief, which is essentially addressing all those concerns that Doha wants us to address. Um, but at, at the reapplication process, you can provide documentary evidence. You can provide more information um, that maybe you weren't able to provide if you decided to appeal um, previously. Uh, in the event that um, your reapplication is accepted, then you should be good to go as long as there's no other additional concerns um, that weren't uh, that weren't present prior to uh, you submitting this new SF86. Um, and you know you can continue on your investigation. It usually is a lot quicker um, once you go through that that uh, reapplication process. In the event that your reapplication is uh, rejected on the contractor side then that 12 month time frame starts over again. So you'd have to wait a period of 12 months from the date of the rejection um, of your reapplication before you can reapply for a second time and you know so on and so forth. And that process will continue for however many time it takes, however many times it takes you to actually um, reapply, uh, or excuse me, to actually get past that reapplication process. Um, military members, federal employees, um, there's not really a reapplication process per se or not as structured any way as um, like it would be for a contractor or the industrial side. Um, however, it will be reviewed, as I said, through the normal investigative process and the adjudicative process. Um, so any previous denials or revocations must be acknowledged on the SF-86. Um, and instead of submitting like an actual reapplication brief like you do on the contractor side, uh, a lot of times you can submit uh, that mitigation or those explanations on your actual SF-86 um, to kind of preemptively mitigate those concerns um, rather than, uh, you know, um, getting a, a, another denial or, um, you know, revocation at that point. Um, and again, on the military member side or federal employee side, you're not going to be issued those letters from Doha. Um, so it's it's really up to you to provide that mitigation um, so you don't have to go through another lengthy process of getting a statement of reasons issued and, you know, going through that whole process of getting your clearance denied again. Um, so, again, that's kind of the process. Same situation applies if you're denied a clearance again um, on the military member of uh, federal employee side, uh, you would have to wait a period again of 12 months before you can reapply for a clearance. And again, that's consistent throughout. So if you're denied. Uh, uh, you know, a second time or a third time, each time you're denied is 12 months that you have to wait before you can reapply for a clearance, regardless if you're a contractor or a military member. Um, so that's kind of the gist and kind of the, the overall um, aspect of uh, the, the differences between the contractor side and the military member side. A lot of it's the same, a lot of it's overlapped. Um, they still use, uh, regardless of what um, what version you're going through, a lot of it is still um, overlapped. 
uh, meaning they still use the same adjudicative guidelines, as I mentioned before, uh, to kind of um, determine if somebody is eligible or should have a security clearance, should be eligible for security clearance. Uh, but again, the biggest differences are the um, uh, where the hearing is uh, and kind of the appeals process. That's really what, what the difference is. Um, you know, so a lot of times, uh, you know, if you're a military member or, or a, uh, um, a federal employee, uh, you know, if you provide a good amount of mitigation uh, and supporting documents with your written response, you know, you have a good opportunity to, to mitigate the concerns of the government and eventually get your clearance, um, uh, you know, good to go or reinstated if it's been previously revoked. Um, now, some of the questions we had um, from the registration that'll kind of uh, go over um, is cost for clearances. So the cost for clearances doesn't cost the employee anything. Um, all the all the costs are paid by the employers, um, whether it's the government agency or whether it's a government contractor. They handle all of the um, all the costs. I've never heard of any employee being uh, requested to uh, pay that. In fact, I don't even think they are allowed to do that. Um, as far as the actual cost goes, I mean, honestly, it's kind of immaterial because you don't have to pay it, but, um, you know, it kind of varies depending on what level of clearance you get. Um, you know, that's something that potentially could be looked up through um, the uh, the DOD website. Um, you can go to dcsa.mil uh, uh, and they can kind of provide, um, you know, that information. Um, a lot of times the uh, the agencies, if it's a government contractor, um, they have to have a facility security clearance in order to be able to employ individuals who have security clearances, or if they're going to be working on a classified contract from the government, they need to have that facility security clearance so they can, you know, be a sponsor and, and you know, sponsor employees for security clearances. So there's a whole process where you have to go through that um, in order to get that. Um, uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a whole nother webinar that we can do on that process. Um, I even think that uh, one of my colleagues, Dan Myers, is uh, doing one um, for the DC bar coming up. I believe it's based upon that. Um, uh, but either way, that, that's kind of where you can get that information. So again, no cost to the employees, uh, but the employers do have some sort of costs depending on um, what, the, uh, what the actual circumstances are um, for the type of clearance you're trying to get or the level of clearance you're trying to get. Um, can you obtain a security clearance if you have a felony charge on your record? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, unless you're trying to get into a special access program, also known as a SAP, um, or if you're trying to get an SCI clearance. Um, those, uh, those are um, essentially prohibited, uh, something called the Bond Act. Uh, which basically prohibits individuals from getting those types of clearances. Um, and it's not necessarily just a felony. What the actual terms are is that if it's, if you were sentenced to a, a year or more or over a year in prison and you actually serve that time. So even if you were actually charged for a felony, uh, you wouldn't necessarily be barred from even those higher level clearances that I just mentioned. Um, if you have, um, if you didn't actually serve that one year time, um, you know, if you're let out early or something like that, then, you know, you'd be fine. As far as a secret or top secret clearance, a felony, it may make it more difficult depending on what the circumstances are. And that may elicit some guideline J allegations, which you would have to, um, you know, potentially mitigate again, depending on what the circumstances are. Um, uh, but it wouldn't be an outright bar for, um, uh, for you to obtain a clearance. Um, I've had a number of clients who have, uh, you know, had uh, significant criminal records um, who've been able to obtain a security clearance. Um, so it's not an outright bar. Um, you know, every uh, agency is going to kind of go over, um, uh, you know, or utilize the adjudicative guidelines, but some are a little bit more strict on those guidelines than others, right? So most of the time, intelligence agencies have a little bit, I don't want to say a higher standard, but they're a little bit more strict as far as that goes. Um, you know, so again, it, it's not an outright bar, um, but, you know, it will raise some security concerns that you'll probably have to go through that adjudicative process that I just went over, uh, you know, for the last 40 minutes, um, uh, you know, as far as, as far as that goes. So it will, it will definitely elicit some red flags. 
Um, MSPB and indefinite suspensions relating to the suspension of access by agencies. So uh, I actually did a webinar on this uh, a few months back um, as far as indefinite suspensions and kind of how that um, how that goes with security clearance um, adjudications. So, um, you know, MSPB is very limited on what they can do with indefinite suspensions uh, or even removals if they're based upon uh, clearance revocations. Um, so um, a lot of times if you're a federal employee, uh, the agency has the ability, if they feel that there's some sort of security clearance, and even military members, to be honest, um, if there's some sort of security clearance concern that they have or red flags, red flags raised that would potentially uh, be a detriment to the national security of the United States, they have the ability to locally suspend your clearance. They don't have the ability to outright revoke it or deny it. That always rests with DCSA uh, or Doha and extension, um, but they do have the ability to um, uh, to locally suspend your clearance. If those agencies locally suspend your clearance, uh, then essentially you, uh, if your job or your position requires you to obtain and or maintain a security clearance or security clearance eligibility even, um, then uh, and your clearance is suspended locally. Um, then at that point, an agency would uh, be able to put you on indefinite suspension pending the outcome of the final adjudication of your clearance. So you can appeal the indefinite suspensions because any appeals of over 14 days or any suspensions of over 14 days can be appealed to MSPB. However, um, most of the time those uh, fail unless there's some due process issues or there's some sort of discrimination there or something along those lines. There's some unique circumstances which you can kind of do, but for the most part, MSPB um, can't look at the underlying reasons for the indefinite suspension. So they can't look at the reasons why your clearance was suspended. They can't look at the reasons why your clearance was revoked, anything like that. They can't look at the merits of the case. They can only look at the actual adverse action itself and most of the time that entails a, um, you know, a, a job that requires a security clearance and you're not having, uh, or you're not meeting that condition of employment because your clearance is either suspended or, you know, fully revoked. So, um, you know, there's, there's some opportunity there uh, to, to try and appeal that, but, you know, MSPB's jurisdiction on that is, is limited. Um, Next question, what is the average time of DOD secret clearance process taking place? Uh, <laughs> I get this question all the time um, and, you know, there's really no set time frame because DOD wants to make sure that they are doing the entire investigation. Um, they want to make sure that they're investigating everything thoroughly. Um, and now they have the, they've always kind of had this, but now they, they, they're more, you heard me mention the, um, <clears throat> the vetting risk operations center. Uh, so VROC inquiries, um, those are, uh, typically what they call the continuing evaluation program. So, um, essentially they can review your clearance at any time is what that means. So, um, you know, the average time to actually go through the process, you know, from the beginning of submitting your SF-86 until you, you know, finally get your clearance, um, it, it depends. Um, if there's no issues, no red flags, I mean, you can get that taken care of within a month. Um, if there's red flags that they have to look at, or if there's, you know, some sort of delay because they have to look at some additional information or whatever, uh, or you have to actually go through the, the, the adjudicative process, meaning a statement of reasons is issued. You have to go through that adjudicative process that, that I just went over. Um, that would be a situation where that obviously would be prolonged. So you heard me at the very beginning of the uh, presentation where I said that it could be anywhere from, uh, you know, a few months to a couple years. That really is the time frame, but no issues. I would say anywhere from one to three months. If you're looking at, and this is average, obviously, if you're looking at the, the entire statement of reasons process, I would say anywhere from 12 to 18 months is, is, is pretty average uh, in order to get that final decision, you know, if you have to go to a hearing and things like that. Um, how do I check or verify the adjudicative process with a favorable versus unfavorable decision? Um, so I'm assuming this means, you know, if you've already submitted a response to statement of reasons, or if you've even submitted just an SF-86 and you're kind of waiting to, to find out what the process is, 
uh, or excuse me, what what the um, uh, status is, if you will. Um, that typically has to go through your security officer. Um, if you're a federal employee or a military member, that's the best way to do it because your security officer can uh, basically submit what they call a customer service request through DISS, uh, Defense Information System for Security, um, and basically ask for an update. In fact, sometimes they don't even have to do that. They could even just check and sometimes they have what the actual status is updated in DISS. Uh, for a contractor, you also should have a security officer and they typically can do that same thing. Um, if there's any type of unfavorable decision, whether it's, uh, you know, like a statement of reasons is going to be issued or something along those lines, um, then that should come in writing through your security officer. So whether you're a contractor or federal employee or military member, any type of uh, official communication from uh, DCSA is going to come through your security officer. Um, reciprocity norms when switching between contract or non-contractor roles inside and outside DOD. If you're inside the DOD, you're going from, let's say, you know, the federal employee uh, to, let's say, I don't know, a, a DOD contract like Northrop Raytheon, whatever it is. Um, typically, it, you don't have to do anything as long as your new company takes over sponsorship for your clearance. If it's within the DOD, it's typically transferable with no issues. Um, you just uh, you know, want to make sure that whatever new company you're going to, whether it's a contractor or government agency, takes over sponsorship of your clearance first before you kind of uh, switch positions. Um, that way, there's no loss of jurisdiction. There's no issues about, you know, the transfer of clearances or anything like that, and everything should be good to go. Um, if you're going from DOD to outside the DOD to another agency or vice versa, um, really depends on the agency, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, there's reciprocity with, uh, you know, some intelligence agencies, um, <clears throat> sometimes even with like DHS versus DOD, things like that. However, those agencies, um, the intelligence agencies and then um, the DHS or even Department of Energy, they all kind of have their separate um, departments that are going to look at it. So, you know, it would make it easier to transition to uh, to a different government agency. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately that's still going to have to be reviewed by uh, their own kind of in-house uh, adjudicators uh, for security clearances. Uh, same thing with going from like an intelligence agency or another, uh, you know, DHS or something like that, DOJ to DOD, same situation. DOD is going to have to take a look at that. Um, and, you know, as long as there's no issues, should be fine. Um, and there should be reciprocity there, but, you know, they're still going to take a look at it. Um, the only thing I'll say is Department of Energy is different um, because Department of Energy has different types of clearances, right? So most of the time, if you're going through any of the intelligence agencies, Department of Justice, um, you know, anything like that, they're pretty much secret, top secret, top secret SCI, top secret SCI with full scope poly or counterintelligence poly, whatever it is. Department of Energy is different. They have different designations for the security clearances. They have Q, uh, Q clearance. They have an L clearance. They have uh, special access programs, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and the process is a little bit different. So you heard me mention, um, you know, you can do a written response and then a hearing um, for DOD. The Department of Energy is one or the other. So you, they have an issue. It's not called a statement of reasons. It's called a summary of your security concerns for the Department of Energy. Um, and you can either submit a written response or you can appear in front of an administrative judge to mitigate those concerns. Um, you can't do both. You can, I guess, you, you, you have to submit a notice of appeal. So I guess within your notice of appeal or your notice of appearance, I should say, a request for personal appearance uh, with Department of Energy, you can submit some information related to that. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, the process is different and, you know, there's really no reciprocity for, um, for DOD and, and Department of Energy because of, you know, the different levels of clearances, what they're called, you know, things like that. And essentially, just what the Department of Energy does, you know, they require you to go through a whole, a whole other uh, investigation. Although, with that being said, uh, you know, if you have a uh, valid DOD clearance, Probably would make it a little bit, a little bit easier to, uh, you know, get a uh, get a clearance uh, adjudicated favorably for you on the Department of Energy side. Um, I believe that's all the questions that we had. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen. I don't know if uh, Taylor, if we have any uh, any questions that were popped in through the um, uh, through the message, but um, you know, we got a little bit more time here, so I'd be more than happy to answer some more of those questions. 
Yeah, there were a couple that were uh, sent over. So if you want to check those out. You want to say that. Uh, one of the questions is, is what if I have an incident report that was closed out, but is sitting in adjudication for months after with no request for further information by, um, by DSS. Um, that is something that you probably want to go through your security officer with, or to try and honestly get your own um, copy of the DISS. A lot of times you can do a four year request and get that information. Um, but if an incident report is closed out, uh, then essentially um, it could be one of two things. Um, if it was closed out, that doesn't necessarily mean it was closed out favorably. Um, so they could be gearing up to issue a statement of reasons or even, you know, like I said before, a, a, um, a in, in interrogatories or a, a BROC inquiry to try and get more information from you. Um, or uh, it could be that they just haven't updated DISS yet with the decision, um, if that decision is favorable. Um, however, uh, you know, I would say that if it's closed out, but it's still sitting and being adjudicated, that probably means that um, they're looking to do one or the other. Um, you know, either, like I said, you know, ask you for more information or to potentially issue a statement of reasons. Um, at what point of the process is the interim clearance granted to DOD contractors? Um, that is uh, typically granted after you um, submit your uh, SF-86. So typically, if uh, there's no issues or any concerns and your interim is granted, it's usually going to be within a couple weeks to a month after um you submit your sf86 um they'll take a look at it basically make the recommendation that the interim planner should be granted again whatever company you're with they would have to um ask for or request that interim clearance um otherwise they'll just process you for the full clearance um if your interim clearance is granted um or if your interim interim clearance is denied that doesn't necessarily mean that your full clearance is going to be granted or denied um because there still has to go through the adjudicative process for the full clearance um, all the interim clearance is allowing you to do if it's granted is to actually start working on classified um, programs or documents or whatever it is during that time. Um, another side note, if your interim clearance is denied, there is no appeals process for a denied interim clearance. You still can go through the full adjudicative process for your full clearance, but if your interim clearance is denied, that's it. Uh, you don't have an opportunity to appeal that option. <clears throat> um, can I submit to apply my own clearance so when I apply for federal jobs, I know uh, that there isn't an issue? Uh, no, you have to always have a uh, sponsor for your security clearance. Um, your, as I mentioned before, each clearance has to have a sponsor. You can't just submit an SF-86 to, you know, uh, DCSA and request that they adjudicate that. Um, any, any clearance, whether it's a, as a federal employee or a government contractor, military member, anything like that, you have to have a sponsor in order to start that process. Um, I think there's one more. Um, can I follow up uh, with an old clearance as to what happened since it was stopped? Uh, yes, you can. You can. Um, if you still have good contacts with your old security officer, they can provide information related to that um, because they have easy access to DISS. If not, then you can do a simple FOIA request to DCSA, um, and then they can provide. Um, you know, it it does. It's not a short process, so they can actually. It does take quite a long time in order to obtain those documents, but you can request a copy of your DISS through um, a, a FOIA request with DCSA. Uh, and they should be able to provide you a printout of the DISS um, that will basically lay out what um, what the uh, the status of that old clearance was, if it was revoked, if it was denied, uh, if there's a loss of jurisdiction, whatever the situation is, it should have a status of whatever that clearance is. Uh, so I think those are all the questions. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to uh, appear um, and, and listen to uh, the webinar today. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much for, for attending.